Tonight, Canada ends evacuation flights from Sudan as conditions near the airfield worsen. I would say that the ceasefire has effectively collapsed. David Common on the ground in the region. Oilers and Leafs fans rejoice as their star-studded teams clear Lord Stanley's first hurdle. It's uh, Austin Matthews and the Leafs taking on Connor McDavid and the Oilers. I, I don't know if the, this country's psyche could handle them. I'll do it perfectly, all right. From Montreal to Hollywood and back again, Jay Baruchel reflects on film, fame, and family. My dad, for me, was as much um, a cautionary tale as a sort of uh, inspiration. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. Tonight, at least 200 Canadians in Sudan are trapped, surrounded by fighting and looting, and the Canadian operation to airlift them to safety has ended. That's because a ceasefire between Sudan's army and the paramilitary group known as the RSF appears to exist on paper only, with both sides blaming the other. Ottawa says the fighting has made airlift operations too dangerous. David Common is in the region as officials arrive to find a way out of the crisis. Meanwhile, some Canadians facing the prospect of a perilous journey through war-torn Sudan on their own. These are among the last Canadians able to make the escape from Sudan by air. The elderly, babies, evacuated to the nearby tiny nation of Djibouti by Canadian soldiers who themselves have now abandoned Sudan as the fighting expands. I would say that the ceasefire has effectively collapsed and there doesn't seem to be any viable uh, mediation uh, avenue forward at this time. Indeed, pilots of the final flight Saturday night could see gunfire just outside the airport. The window for air evacuations from Wadi Sedna is closing. The end of the airlift leaves 200 plus Canadian citizens stuck. Getting out now past all that fighting, very difficult. Our work is not done and the government of Canada is working with allies to find possible ways for those who wish to depart Sudan. Those who can escape by land may end up in hastily created refugee camps or make the more than day long drive to Port Sudan. This one in convoys of vehicles sometimes organized by Western militaries. There, ferries and other ships pull people to safety. That port protected by warships, including these ones, redirected to the zone by Canada's Navy. And now in the region, Canada's foreign minister, Melanie Jolie, arriving in Kenya to press for some way to stop the violence in Sudan. If we don't find a peaceful solution quickly, uh, we know this could become one of the worst humanitarian crises in decades here in the eastern part of Africa. The conflict likely to grow the migration crisis in Africa exponentially. Even evacuees who've made it out weren't sure they would do so alive. My parents got to a, a point where they were essentially starting to come to terms with the fact that there might not be an exit for them and that they might, you know, die. Those who do manage to get out are moving through airports like this, Nairobi's, where hundreds, if not thousands, of evacuees have moved through on their way to places like Canada. It is major hubs like this that are seeing this huge uptick in traffic. David Palman, CBC News, Nairobi. Back here at home, let's start in Alberta, where tonight hundreds of people have been forced out of their houses by the threat of wildfires, hoping theirs won't be the next to go up in flames. Julie Wong shows us what they're going through and why. Fire crews are trying to gain the upper hand on wildfires burning near Entwistle and Evansburg, west of Edmonton. Roughly 1,200 people live in the small communities. We had three police cars all within five to seven minutes say, OK, it's, we have to go. Mandatory evacuation orders mean Mark Chuchka and his family of six were forced to leave their home. They're now staying with a friend nearby. You just uh, pray that the situation is the best that it possibly can be. Margaret Hodgkinson is staying at an evacuation center. She grabbed whatever she could bring with her. It was a little bit scary because there was like a lot of smoke coming from the south and 
from behind the house, it was a lot of smoke coming from the north. The fires cover about 30 square kilometers. They have destroyed at least one house and some outbuildings. Helicopters, air tankers and dozens of firefighters are working desperately to tame the out of control flames. Right now it's, it's just to keep working the flanks of this fire, trying to cut it off and pinch it out of any fuel. But the conditions are far from ideal. There's been little rain, the wind is a challenge and temperatures have been rising. There have been smaller fires that have popped up, uh, but nothing to this scale. Alberta Wildfire says these fires are just a sign of what's to come. It's springtime in Alberta, so what we're seeing is as the snow recedes, um, the dried grasses from the previous fall are on the landscape. They can ignite very easily. Julie, what's the sense you're getting from residents? So, Ian, people here are resilient. There have been wildfires in this area in the past, so locals are familiar with what to do. And the wildfires here aren't the only ones burning in the province. There are 40 active wildfires in Alberta as of tonight, and the forecast calls for higher temperatures this week. Julia Wong on a windy evening. Thank you. And in the B.C. interior tonight, more than 1,000 people are ready to flee their homes at a moment's notice. Two separate wildfires have been causing concern in the Caribou region, the bigger one covering more than two square kilometres, the other about half that size. In both cases, human activity is suspected as the cause. And a terrifying moment in Florida as a tornado flipped this car right over. Residents are assessing the damage tonight after the tornado barreled through the coastal city of Palm Beach Gardens yesterday. Wind gusts touching more than 200 kilometers an hour. So far, there have been no reports of any deaths or major injuries. And staying in the U.S., where an urgent manhunt is expanding in Texas, authorities trying to find the man accused of fatally shooting five people in the house next door to his. As the CBC's Katie Simpson reports, investigators are tonight desperate for leads. The search is not moving as quickly as police want. And so officers from across the state have been called in, more than 200 of them, going door to door, hoping an $80,000 reward will generate credible leads. We're asking everyone for your help till we can bring this suspect or this monster, I will call him, to justice. 38-year-old Francisco Oropesa is considered armed and dangerous. Police dogs tracked his scent into a wooded area until muddy, wet conditions halted that part of the search. Investigators hit another setback after the suspect photo they released to the public for tips was a picture of the wrong person. Can you, do you all believe that the suspect is still in the area? We do not know. Like I said, we have right now we have zero leads. The attack happened here late Friday in what apparently started as a noise dispute. Oropesa was firing a gun on his property and was asked by neighbors to be quiet because a baby was sleeping. He allegedly responded by storming the neighbor's home, shooting and killing five people, including an eight-year-old boy. The child's father sobbed, telling reporters in Spanish his son and wife are dead. At an emotional vigil, little comforted mourners in this brutal moment of grief. My heart is with this eight-year-old little boy. The victims in this case were members of the Honduran community. They were not all related, but they lived together in that house. The Honduran foreign minister is demanding the full weight of the law be used in this investigation. Local officials want the same, but they have to find the suspect first. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. U.S. banking regulators are desperate to find a buyer for the troubled First Republic Bank. Shares in the bank plunged this week when it revealed customers had withdrawn more than $100 billion. That was back in March, when the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank was prompting concern about a wider banking crisis. J.P. Morgan Chase is said to be among those making an offer for First Republic. The United States is looking for Canadian help on border control. It wants Ottawa to reimpose visa requirements for Mexican citizens over concerns some may cross illegally from Canada to the U.S. 
Here's Kate McKenna on the details and the politics. When it comes to illegal migration into the U.S., the southern border gets most of the attention. But American officials are also looking north. On Rosemary Barton Live, the Biden administration confirms it has asked Canada to reimpose visa requirements for Mexican nationals. Have you discussed those visa requirements, whether you'd like those to come back into place? Uh, so I think that's a decision that um, uh, the Canadian officials are, are going to make. Uh, we talk about this issue and many issues that impact uh, the migration of people. They don't need a visa to travel to Canada, but they do need one to go to the United States. U.S. officials worry some could then travel to Canada and cross illegally into the United States. Focus on the northern border comes amid a spike in crossings. U.S. authorities say they have intercepted nearly 2,000 Mexican nationals in the last six months, compared to just under 900 the year before. To be sure, a tiny fraction compared to those trying to cross the southern border. We're in a battle for the soul of America. But with his second White House run now confirmed, some observers say President Joe Biden is facing pressure to be stronger on border control. It's an issue that um, tends to divide uh, Democrats uh, between the, you know, the more uh, progressive and more moderate factions of it and something that Republicans see as political ammunition to use against the president in an election year. A senior Canadian source confirms that U.S. officials have brought up the issue of Mexican visas multiple times this year. But a statement from the Office of the Minister of Immigration says that despite American concern, there are no plans to bring the visas back. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. The two sides in the ongoing strike by public sector workers continued talks this weekend. Today, the Public Service Alliance of Canada reported some progress on salary demands and job security. Saturday, the federal government presented what it called its final offer, which it said included an increase in wages. Workers have been on strike since April 19th. A day after sending their fans into a state of unbridled joy, two Canadian teams now turn their attention to the next round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. The Toronto Maple Leafs finally won a series, while the Edmonton Oilers carried on from last year's success. Travis Danraj looks at a dramatic night on the ice and in the streets. No, these aren't the cheers of joy for winning a Stanley Cup. Not even close. But for Leafs fans, just getting past the first round is the bar for success these days. Can't believe it. Pinch me, please. Pinch me. Buddy, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us to see this. It's been 19 years. Leafs won! Leafs won! Yes, 19 years is a long time. Toronto last made the final eight back in 2004. Joe Neuendijk was the hero that night. 268 skaters, 33 goalies, 7 coaches, and 6,948 days later, 32-year-old centre John Tavares was the hero this time round. John Tavares! They finally caught lightning in the bottle! Obviously, uh, nice to get it, um, but at the same time, it's just step one, and, and we know we, uh, we got uh, a lot more work ahead. And the Edmonton Oilers have punched their ticket to the second round. The Oilers also jumped a major hurdle this weekend, eliminating the LA Kings to move on to round two. From Ryan Nugent Hopkins to Connor McDavid, the team is loaded with top talent and hoping for a huge playoff run. Oh, it goes in! It goes in! It's got some, including this Sportsnet hockey analyst, daydreaming about an all-Canadian final. If it's uh, Austin Matthews and the Leafs taking on Connor McDavid and the Oilers, I, I don't know if the, this country's psyche could handle that, but it would be a fun two weeks. On both sides of the country, the big wins are giving fans hope. I think we're killing them in the second round. We're taking this cup home. For one weekend, they're savoring this moment. <laughs> Expectations and optimism high as round two gets underway. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Toronto. Turning to the UK now, where preparations continue for the crowning of King Charles III. These are just some of the thousands of British Armed Forces members rehearsing for the military procession ahead of Saturday's coronation. King Charles himself took time this weekend to inspect work on some of the traditional chairs to be used in parts of the ceremony as they are meticulously reupholstered by hand. 
Adrian is now in London where she'll have special coronation coverage all week, including an exclusive conversation with one of the King's closest confidants. Here's Adrian with a taste of that. Here we are again on the cusp of history, the King's coronation just a few days away now. What is that future going to look like in a world where some countries are cutting ties with the monarchy, others are thinking about it, support is shifting, and uncertainty about the new king is very real. We got a rare opportunity to put some of those questions to the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. She's considered the hardest working royal, more engagements than even her brother, the king. She doesn't do many interviews. This was her only Canadian conversation. So we got right to it with a question about what's ahead. I think for my brother, this is something he's been waiting for. And he's probably spent more time thinking about it. For the rest of us, it's more a question of, okay, we have to shift the way we support. And that's, that's what we need to do. And what does that shift look like for you? Well, that's, <laughs> that is yet, that's, we don't know yet. My mother didn't change very much. We kind of knew what the rhythm of the year was. Mm -hmm. So that will, things like that will change. And, you know, how we get, um, how we are part of the support for the monarchy may change slightly. Who knows? Sometimes people refer to a slimmed down monarchy. I, I can't imagine what, what that might mean for a role like yours. I, I don't know how many more hours in the day you have to take more things on. <laughs> well, I think the slim down was, was said in a day when there were a few more people around to make that seem like a justifiable right. <laughs> comment. <laughs> the um, world changes a bit. It changes a bit. I mean, not least of all, passage of time and cousins getting older and mm -hmm. um, anyway, it was the logic. Uh, no, it will... It doesn't sound like a good idea from where I'm standing, I have to say. I'm, sure I'm not well. quite sure what else, you know, we can do. So a conversation about what's ahead, to be sure. But also we talked about the effect of the last few years on her family, what COVID did, for example. She spoke in particular about its effect on her mother, the Queen, as well as Prince Philip. And she spoke of what that experience was like escorting her mother's coffin across the country. A princess's perspective tomorrow on The National. And that's just some of the content we'll have leading up to the coronation of King Charles III. Adrian will host our CBC coverage. I'll be in London as well. It all starts Saturday, May 6th at 4 a.m. Eastern. You can watch on CBC News Network, CBC News Explore, or on GEM. The coronation is bringing a different kind of conversation to the forefront in India. Why don't we call it what it is? It is one of the spoils of conquest. A symbol of the British monarchy and of its colonial past. A new documentary looks at the resistance inside Russia and the danger of challenging the Putin regime. Their attempts are in vain, you know, they will not succeed. And... There's three people you don't want to see in the courtroom. That's Dominion, Cardi B, or Gwyneth Paltrow. Roy Wood Jr. takes on the headlines and the president at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Is Joe Biden awake? We're back into. <laughs> Hundreds of pro-Putin bikers in Moscow held a rally in support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine this weekend. They called it a show of patriotism. Russians who oppose the war, on the other hand, can't do so openly without facing repression. A new documentary that takes us inside their struggle just premiered at the Toronto Hot Docs Festival. And earlier, Briar Stewart got to speak with the film's Estonian creator. In the capital of Estonia, a country that feels increasingly threatened by its next door neighbor, there's a private screening that offers a glimpse of life in Russia in the years leading up to the war. This film is called The Last Relic, and it follows a number of struggling opposition activists in the Russian city of Ekaterinburg. And it's having its world premiere at the Hot Dogs Film Festival at the end of April. I'm planning to soon to go to Canada. Mariana Cott started making the film in 2017. Over the years, she said the climate of fear became more pronounced. Half of her characters in this film have now fled Russia, 
Those that remain are being hounded by the security services. There is only very few people who really want to, to, to fight, you know, let's say. Uh, and uh, I understood that their attempts are in vain, you know, they will not succeed. Members of the grassroots opposition couldn't agree on a goal or a strategy. It was becoming more dangerous to protest. And in the background, Moscow's military machine was getting louder. In the audience, Nikolai Archimenko, who fled Russia last year. I feel, I feel um, like an empty, empty, thing, empty feeling in my, um, my stomach. People in my country do not understand what's right and what's wrong. Terry McDonald, a Canadian professor with Tallinn University, says the film emphasized that it's all but impossible to protest in Russia. So many of, like, say, the students we encounter here, this regime has been in power since before they're born. You know, uh, there's literally, they've never known a way to make an impact in a fair and just society. I want to just live to the change, to the fall of this regime. Caught had hoped to be able to screen the film in Yekaterinburg too, but that's now impossible. But she hopes it did at least spark a conversation in Toronto. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. At the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner this weekend, the U.S. President came with a serious message about press freedom and disinformation and some jokes. After all, I believe in the First Amendment, not just because my good friend Jimmy Madison wrote it. Joe Biden, who just launched his re-election campaign, made fun of his age and took some digs at Fox Hell. News' defamation settlement. I'd call Fox honest, fair, and truthful, but then I could be sued for defamation. And he gave a shout-out to basketball star Brittany Griner, released four up. months Come ago on. in a prisoner exchange with Come Russia. A dark branding. The dinner is about taking jabs at Washington's political and media elite. We got to get Tucker back on the air, Mr. President, because right now there's millions of Americans that don't even know why they hate you. <laughs> the jokes were rooted in the news, from America's culture wars to mass shootings. Drag queens are not at a school to groom your kids. And even if they were, most of them kids gonna get shot at school. It ain't no problem. Don't grow past legislation. A sharp reminder of serious differences and tragic outcomes. Actor Jay Baruchel left the bright lights of Hollywood behind to put a spotlight on home. What do you call it? It's called a Blackberry. Huh. He tells me why his latest movie is quintessential Canadiana. Toiling in anonymity, but creating such an important thing to, to sort of global culture. What's more Canadian than that? And the coronation brings up Britain's troubled history. It has come to represent a very cold, hard reminder of colonialism. The shiniest thing that you've got in this conversation is the Koh-i-Noor. The crown jewels some say should be returned. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. It comes down as a unity symbol of friendship and part of a Scotland's contribution to the coronation. Scotland's ancient Stone of Scone has arrived in London for the coronation of King Charles. Also known as the Stone of Destiny, it has been used in the crowning of British monarchs for seven centuries and of Scottish kings for centuries before that. As per tradition, it will be positioned underneath the coronation chair when Charles is crowned on Saturday. That coronation will feature many historical treasures and artifacts, but the famous Koh-i-Noor diamond will not be among them, as debate rages over its rightful ownership. India is among the countries laying claim to the stone, and as Salima Shivji shows us, it also serves as a painful reminder of looted treasures India wants back. A sacred temple deep in India's southeastern state that's missing a part of its soul. 
The Sundar Gurumal temple has been operating for decades now without performing one of the most important Hindu rituals, ever since the temple's god was stolen, ripped out of its honored place. For the worshippers gathered, the pain of that loss is immeasurable. Without our God's statue, this temple has lost all its glory, the priest Arava Mudan says. We feel helpless knowing a part of our family has been taken. It was snatched and carted off by smugglers in 1957. On display still today at Oxford's Ashmolean Museum, complete with a recently added acknowledgement that it may have been stolen. And the coil kind of. I don't know why or how it went to Britain, says this man, but everyone knows it rightfully belongs to us. That ache at the indignity courses through the temple's faithful. It breaks my heart, and we hear about it happening elsewhere too, this woman says. Thousands of temples have been plundered across India, their ancient and sacred idols stolen, and set behind glass to be gawked at in museums and in wealthy private homes across the world. Some of these were recovered from one of Kapoor's prominent dealers and some that... It's the ultimate insult for Vijay Kumar, what he calls colonial loot. So these so were stolen? Yeah, this was stolen. He's made it his mission to corral a gang of volunteers who painstakingly track down stolen artifacts in their free time and work to get them returned to their rightful owners. We're not doing this for any money. We don't take any funding. We don't take any donations, nor awards or rewards. Our only reward is to bringing the gods back home. It's a monumental task, persuading museums abroad to do the right thing and urging law enforcement so to do more. We were looking for this place. The sleuths are meticulous and they've had success, bringing home more than 600 lost treasures in the past decade. And there's the crown. What's not part of their focus is the most infamous of India's lost jewels, the Kohinoor diamond, the jewel set in the crown belonging to the Queen Mother. And it has the Kohinoor diamond on it. And, fact, and now with Charles as king passed on to Camilla, queen consort. And many countries lay claim to that diamond. India chief among them. Kohinoor to wapas karne ki maang ki thi. Is the clamor to bring the diamond home has gotten louder. Anita Anand, historian and journalist, co-wrote the definitive book on the diamond's controversial history. It has come to represent a very cold, hard reminder of colonialism. There is a new appetite to discuss these things, to revisit these things right now. And the shiniest thing that you've got in this conversation is the Koenor that sat in the Tower of London that gleams with a reminder of, for Indians, the humiliation of, of the Raj. And the humiliating memory of how it landed in British hands, the last Maharaja of Punjab, 10 years old, coerced into handing it over. Unless a gift is given at the point of a bayonet, um, this can't be considered a gift. So why don't we call it what it is? It is one of the spoils of conquest. But any talk of returning the Kohinoor is fraught with diplomatic minefields, including the messy question of which country has the most valid claim to it, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Apology and the current come. rules, historians say, are major roadblocks. The British Museums Act do not permit removal of any object. And in 1970, the, U, the uh, UNESCO Convention also laid down that uh, anything that is looted can be returned, but only if it, is, it has been looted after 1970. The royal family is hyper aware of the diamond's power. Camilla won't be wearing the Koinor crown in next week's coronation, after Narendra Modi's government made clear that doing so would evoke painful memories of the colonial past. And mere weeks after Charles is crowned, the Tower of London will display the Koinur and label it a symbol of conquest. A smart move, some say, but one that has its limits. The idea that just by moving it out of the spotlight, um, was going to make people forget about it, I think is, is not right. For those at India's Pride Project dedicated to restoring this country's lost heritage, the long missing diamond still stings. I think it's very insulting to go up to the Tower Bridge and, and pay 10 pounds to see an object of loot. You should be ashamed. But it's these precious stolen deities that command their full attention. The coin was just a stone to me. Our gods are priceless. 
priceless and so many thousands of them still lost, leaving the faithful bereft praying for their return. Saliba, you talk about the difficulty in getting so many of these cultural artifacts back. What's the Indian government's stance on the Kuinoa's return? Well, it's gone back and forth over the years. In 2016, India's Solicitor General actually stated that the diamond was a gift and not stolen, which is significant on the side of the Kohinoor not returning. The current BJP government said last fall that they have been raising the issue of the diamond with UK officials from time to time and that they will continue to do so and to explore ways to resolve this matter. What that means precisely is actually unclear. It's highly unlikely that the Kohinoor will just be handed over. But what is clear is is that the diamond, even when very far from sight, has the potential to cause a diplomatic stir. Thanks, Salima. Next, he made it in Hollywood. Now he's betting on Canada. I want to spend my entire career um, telling Canadian stories and, and making them part of our kind of uh, common cultural tapestry. Yes, Actor Jay Baruchel opens up about his future hopes and his difficult past. Next. We're in the Beaches neighborhood in Toronto, the Fox Theatre, with Jay Baruchel. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Yeah, really nice to meet you. Of course. Uh, looking so, forward to, to chatting with you, but I just want to warm up a little bit. I'm going to throw three or four things out. Quick answers. Please. Okay? Please. Hollywood. Uh, it's a place. <laughs> Montreal. It's the place. <laughs> <laughs> Seth Rogen. He's a uh, uh, family. And uh, Blackberry. Oh, uh, a terrific movie and an even more terrific uh, device. <laughs> okay. Lots more to talk about, but first let's take a look at Jay's life in 30 seconds. After a modest start in Canadian television, Jay Baruchel got his big Hollywood break in the early 2000s. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, we're like having a party tonight. Do you like want to come? His work in Judd Apatow's Undeclared led to a number of blockbuster roles. You know what your problem is, Kirk? What? You're a moodle. A moodle? A man poodle. But he never felt comfortable in Hollywood, so he soon returned home to Canada, where his passion for the Habs is matched by his desire to tell Canadian stories on film. And it doesn't get more Canadian than his latest role, the man who pioneered the Blackberry. That guy is sketchy. I don't think he's sketchy. I started by asking Jay about those early days in Los Angeles. You were, what, maybe 18 years old and you moved to Los Angeles, yeah. to Hollywood, to work on a program with, with Seth Rogen, Judd Apatow, Jason Segel. Yeah. What was that like? It's crazy, man. <laughs> it's like all of my friends uh, were spending money to go and uh, go to university, and I was getting paid to pretend that I was. <laughs> it was sick, it was the best. I was 18, it's my first time living alone, um, and it's there, you know, it, it's, it wasn't like Sarnia. Like, I, I, my first time was like, living in, in, in Hollywood, literally, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in like West Hollywood and, and shit. Um, I was very lucky, a lot of people have it far worse than me, I need to stress that, uh, but at the same time, I could never call it easy. Uh, you know, and um, the fact that I came out of that era without any sort of like crippling addictions or, or, or um, let's say, inconvenient mental issues, all, all of my mental issues are manageable. <laughs> so, so, so like, I don't know how, I, I do. My mom raised me right and I, you know, was surrounded by pretty good people. But, uh, but boy, it could have gone, it could have gone either way. Also, you had the benefit of CBC News World. Yes, I did. I oh. read that you... <laughs> it's true, yeah, though. You, you had a cable <laughs> system that, that got much music and, 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 and News, News World. World yeah. and, and that was for an 18-year-old kid who couldn't drive in Los Angeles. I lived and was feeling it. lonely. Yeah, it, it saved me. We were your lifeline. You, you, you joke. You bring it up with your tongue near your cheek, but I swear to God, man, like that was like a big... That was a big thing. That was the only channels that I had. Those are the only channels I had on in my apartment. Hosted by frontline journalists Joe Schlesinger and Ian Hanamansing on News World International. I have always been someone who gets homesick super easy. I was always the kid that would like uh, call my parents 
from a sleepover right before it was bedtime. We were watching movies, it was fine. We were eating pizza, it was fine. It was time to go to bed. I would lose my shit and I'd always have to call dad to come and rescue me. Wow. You know, and so to me, it's not crazy that I had a version of that down there. And so I just like made my little piece of Hollywood sovereign Canadian soil. And so when you would come into my apartment, yeah, there'd be a big Canadian flag on the wall and News World would be on. Yeah. It, it, speaking of your dad, you, you wrote a, a fantastic book, Thank you. Uh, which made me laugh out loud, even as you talked about the, the trauma within your family yes. and, and your difficult uh, relationship with your dad, who you describe as, as having been uh, an addict yeah. and, and died young and died after being estranged from you. Um, how much does that relationship shape who you turned out to be? At least 50% uh, of who I am is because of that. Uh, um, it hard, hard not to, like, um, for, for better or worse, you know. Um, I think, like, my dad, for me, was as much um, uh, a cautionary tale as a sort of uh, inspiration. No, not as much. I'll say, let's go, let's go 70 cautionary, 30 inspired. <laughs> Because uh, he was dead. My father was a, was a fucking garbage fire. I never once saw my father sober. I have no idea what that looks like, you know, um, because he was like, he was frigged from about 11 a.m. every single day. And he's popping a lot of pills and still blowing rails and all this stuff, like ugly shit. So the, the good part of that is um, when you grow up in the like third act of Goodfellas, <laughs> when, when, when it's just paranoia and uh, clammy, pallid skin and, uh, and irritability and uh, it, the, the hard drugs lose their kind of sex, their allure, right? So I, to this day, um, uh, have never tried cocaine. I've never tried half of the shit my dad did because... Uh, out of either fear of being him, but also just like it never seemed appealing. He also is, to his credit, he, he's part of why I'm still in this kind of world because it, it, he would rent a movie every Friday and Saturday night and I'd wake up early the next morning, Saturday morning and Sunday morning, and if the tape was still in the VCR, that meant that, oh, mom and dad think I'm allowed, I'm okay, it's okay for me to watch. If it was back in this case, it was like sort of too racy for me. So this meant that dad fed me movies and often with a sort of like 101 course before it of why this movie is good, why mm -hmm. he liked it, his memory seeing it the first time. My father really just wanted me to have a thing I cared about and his dad never went to a single one of his fucking hockey games. His entire, wow. the entire time he played hockey. And so he was like, he had it in his mind that no matter what, I'm not going to be that. And so if my kid likes movies, I'm going to lean into that. So he bought me movie books every single Christmas. He always just bought me books about movies. Sometimes it was the Leonard Malton guide. Sometimes it was literally the in-house like buyer's catalog that a video store would have when there was time, come time for them to order next month's movies. And he would just be like, what can I give you for that? Because my kid will read it. Stop talking. Listen up. So Adrian, do we view us like the sort of final third of his trajectory leading up to the hit? Because that's what we're going to cover on Sean. Right? So Canadian guy, you, you've done a couple of movies about a hockey enforcer, Goon, now Blackberry. And I kind of feel like you know, trilogies are nice. So years from now, people should look back at, at the Jay Baruchel Canadian trilogy. <laughs> so you need to do one more, one yes. more topic. Uh, what I, what would know. that be? Oh boy, I, that's so nice of you to ask and you're gonna regret asking. <laughs> uh, um, Is it about me? I, <laughs> <laughs> Ian, exclamation mark. It's a sort of uh, musical about, uh, yeah. You, Rookie cub reporter fighting his way through the Halifax, CBC Halifax newsroom. Exactly, and I like that. <laughs> that works for me. Um, no, all, all I want to do is uh, to uh, immortalize, to romanticize without glorifying Canadian stories. I, I think that, you know, in English Canada, it's something that we have historically not been great at. Yep. For, for good honorable reasons, because I think that like we inherit a sort of um, stiff upper lip from the Brits. Uh, 
but we're also raised next to the crucible of, uh, of Americana. And I know that like, uh, and it's a, very, it's a very condescending, patronizing thing that we do to ourselves where we don't want to be like them. And we don't want, we're not the fireworks people. So, so the cost of that is that if you go down on the street corner, um, all of these kind of flashpoints of, of Canadian history that in a lot of other countries would be part of the, the sort of uh, origin myth of that country, mm -hmm. People don't know. There are people out there that won't know what the Halifax explosion is. There yep. are people that, you know, I, I, I could go on. There's a whole, a whole bunch of people out there who, who probably know the name Vimy Ridge, but don't know what happened there. They know the name Billy Bishop because there's an airport, but they don't know why we named an airport after him. Uh, Darcy McGee, there's a, you know, but anyway. So I want to spend my entire career um, telling Canadian stories and, and making them part of our kind of uh, common cultural tapestry because um, there, there is some fascinating shit that has happened here just like in any other country um, and it's okay to admit that and by admitting that you're not necessarily um, qualifying it. You don't have to say it's good or bad, it's just interesting and it happened. And so where does the Blackberry movie fit in all of that? So the story of Blackberry of these kind of Canadian nerds who, um, you know, tried to innovate in earnest and um, and sort of had a sort of uh, cockeyed kind of good faith approach to uh, entrepreneurship, um, ultimately get ruined by the monster of laissez-faire capitalism. And I think that is something that can resonate throughout this country. So I, I think that Blackberry is an important Canadian story um, because uh, number one, it sets the table for the world that we live in now, the way that we relate to one another, the way that uh, news is disseminated, the way that uh, families um, sort of know each other, the way the world understands each other, the way that elections are won and lost is in large part on a device in your hand. Mm -hmm. And that is something that some nerds in Waterloo created. That he, they are not household names. Okay, uh, what, um, uh, twenty-five percent for two hundred and fifty thousand. Fifty percent for fifty bucks. Thirty-three percent for one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and you can run the company with me. Mike, no, no. We yes, can. deal, deal. So toiling in anonymity, but creating such an important thing to to sort of global culture. What's more Canadian than that? Well, when you're ready to do Ian exclamation mark, give me a call. You got it. Done and <laughs> done. Right. Real pleasure Thank talking to you. Thank you for having me. I knew he was funny. I, I discovered chatting with him. He is like off the charts smart. And my big regret is that whole interview is about 30 minutes long and that we could only play about 11. Uh, there's gold, lots of gold that we didn't get a chance to show. Coming up next. <laughs> When the Leafs' playoff victory coincides with your wedding in our moment. What a night. Pure jubilation on the streets of Toronto. Fireworks included as Leafs fans celebrated a moment 19 years in the making. But for fans Mark and Adele Tommaso, the victory coincided with another very special moment, their wedding day. But it didn't stop them from toasting to both occasions. The double celebration is our moment. I'm a huge Leafs fan, and the event coordinator uh, approached me and said, you know, do, do you guys want to put on the hockey game? And of course, uh, I was thrilled, and I was like, "Okay, I gotta get, I gotta get the wife's approval here." Yeah, and the bride gave the final approval to put the the game on behind the bar TV. It's it was a, a game day decision, but a good one. The place erupted. It was like party, party after that. Look at the video. There was grown men hugging grown men, people high fiving each other that are you know, opposite sides of the families and yeah. stuff. It was, uh, it was electric. I was on the dance floor when it happened, but I could just hear the eruption of just cheers out, out in the hall. Everyone's talking about the wedding and they're talking about the game and it just kind of goes hand in hand together and it was truly awesome. 
I got to marry the love of my life, and the Leafs won. <laughs> Thank goodness the Leafs won, um, but also like there's nothing like the jubilation of sports fans when everything works out well. I remember uh, the night I graduated from university, the Montreal Canadiens won the cup back in 1986, and I spent most of the evening in front of the TV basically celebrating that way. That is The National for April 30th. Have a great night.